Hello, my name's Richard Felix, and I'm here at my base in the old county jail in the centre of Derby. This building is becoming one of the most haunted buildings in the country, and possibly the most haunted part is behind me, behind this old cell door. This is the condemned cell of Derby Jail. So, why not come inside and join me. When we recently shot one of the most haunted programmes for Living TV in here, a cross, a wooden cross, was placed on this very bed, this original prison bed. And during the night, on camera, it moved of its own accord. You can still see in here the blackness from the fire not many weeks ago in this room. And the fire brigade say there was absolutely no earthly explanation for it whatsoever. Over the past year, I've been travelling the length and breadth of Great Britain on the national ghost tour of Great Britain. And what you're about to see are some of the best parts, some of the most haunted bits of that tour. After this tour, I've realised that people do most definitely see ghosts. Whether it is the dead returning, I'm not sure. What I'm not sure about is whether the ghost is there or here. No one knows. Anyway, settle back, turn down the lights, give me your full attention, and let me take you on a tour of some of the most haunted parts of Great Britain. I'm looking for the Rodney Street Spectre is in this churchyard and it's completely boarded up and gated and the only way was over this wall so here we go we may be able to film the police arresting me as well I'm inside I'm going to be very quick before the police come this incredible tomb here never seen anything like it is one of the most haunted places in Liverpool. This is the tomb of William Alistair Mackenzie. He was a famous character in Liverpool. He was a railway promoter and he was a gambler. He died, as people do, and in his will he said that he wanted to be buried, dressed, sitting at a card table with his winning hand on the table. That's exactly what happened. And the sitting up body of Mr. Mackenzie is actually inside that tomb. There are many, many ghost stories to do with it. In fact, there are more people that haven't seen him that have seen him. He's seen wearing a top hat and a cloak. People liken him to a vampire. Policemen have seen him, milkmen have seen him. People going to and from their jobs along Rodney Street have seen him. He even propositioned a prostitute. He hadn't got his top hat on and he was talking to her, asking how much she would charge. He then wrapped his cloak around him, put his top hat on and she fled to the local police station, told them that she'd been propositioned by this vampire and the policeman said to her, it wasn't in Rodney Street, was it? And just now, as I was trying to break in over the wall, um, a hot dog seller around the other side said, excuse me, mate, can you leave that board where it is? I said, well, can I just borrow it to break into the churchyard? Oh, he said, if you see a man in a top hat and a cloak, remember me to him, because he says, I've seen him on frequent occasions. I'm not waiting to see him. It's daylight now, but I'm going to break out of this churchyard and go home.
you really won't find many more bleak, exposed spots than this anywhere in England. I'm standing on the highest point of an old drover's road. This is a Saxon cross that marks the point very close to Otterburn. Down below is the village of Elsdon. But above me here is Winter's Gibbet. In 1791, William Winter, aided by two gypsies, murdered an old lady called Margaret Crozier in Elsdon. He was sentenced to be hanged at Newcastle. Public opinion was very high and before he was hanged, he was measured for his last suit in the condemned cell. He was measured by the blacksmith because the blacksmith made him a gibbet cage for him to be hung up here. He was hanged until he was dead, taken down and before he was put into his coffin, the body was tarred to preserve it. He was loaded into a cart and brought up here to this high point overlooking the cottage where Margaret lived. And they hung him up 30 feet high in a gibbet cage and left him to rot, left him for the crows to pick at his flesh and his eyes. And after many years, the bones dropped out of the cage and he was buried. It was customary for the bones to be buried beneath the gibbet. But they don't think this happened here because about a hundred yards away from this spot is a gateway with a cattle grid on the road. And that is where the ghost of William Winter has been seen on many occasions. Standing by the side of the road, longingly looking back towards his gibbet post. And of course, London's underground is dreadfully haunted. This was used as air raid shelters during the Blitz in the Second World War. The number of accidents that, of course, and deaths that were caused while it was being built, and of course, the number of suicides that have taken place over the years means that of all of London, the underground is as haunted as anywhere. And here at the Elephant and Castle, um, very, very haunted, lots of ghost stories. There is a um, story of a white lady that wanders around the platforms late at night. Even when the place is completely closed down, they hear footsteps, people hear screams, phantom tappings, and sounds of doors opening and closing, even when the place is completely secure. And here, um, a driver of the tube actually reported seeing a ghost. And this is a copy of a letter written by him after his uh, strange sighting here. It was around six in the evening at a Bakerloo Line underground station about a week ago. I was in pursuit of my duties as an employee of London Underground, Northern Line. So I joined the train at the terminus at the Elephant and Castle and walked to the front of the train with a view to travelling with the driver. At this point, the driver had not arrived, and so I put my bag down and moved to the rear door to wait for him. While I was waiting, a girl gets into the carriage, dressed in white. She walked straight through the carriage, and I had to move aside, making some muttered apology. I sort of have to do this, since I am in uniform. A minute or so later, the driver turns up, and we move towards the front of the train. When I noticed that the girl was no longer in the carriage. It was rather immediate concern for both of us. She could not have left the train without passing us. I had full view of the carriage and platform at the time. My reaction 
was to inform the driver. The only place she could have gone was to have walked down the tunnel. Not really what we wanted. The driver's response was unusual to say the least. He said, oh her, we hear about her all the time. She's even been in the newspapers. And the driver's reply, lovely, my first real ghost story is a media celebrity. And of course, yet another story to do with the Bank of England underground station. The ghost of a girl called Sarah Whitehead. Strange, strange story of execution. She still haunts the platforms of that underground station. She also haunts the area around the Bank of England to this day. And that's where we're heading now. And of course, the roads in Warwickshire must be some of the most haunted roads in the country. Lying as it does in the centre of the country, anyone passing through north, south, east or west would have at some time to go through Warwickshire. And because of that, in the 18th century, it was a famous haunt for highwaymen. And the famous Dick Turpin, of course, was around here on many occasions. He worked the road between Leamington Spa and the Leicestershire border, which was known as Watling Street. On many occasions, his ghostly form has been seen by motorists. And one night, a group of motorcyclists saw this figure sitting on a horse in the middle of the road with a tricorn hat and a red-lined cloak. They took evasive action and went to the right and left of him. Nobody hit him. And they pulled up and looked back and he disappeared into the hedgerow. Dick Turpin forged a liaison with Tom King, the famous Birmingham highwayman and they worked the roads together. Turpin was hanged at York in 1739, and Tom King was burnt at the stake at Sutton Park in Birmingham, which of course in those days was in Warwickshire. But of course, to bring it up to date, there are also modern ghost stories to do with the roads. And if you use the old Rugby to Coventry Road, instead of using the motorway link. When you arrive near Church Lawford, beware, beware of a ghost lorry that appears in front of you with its lights blazing on your side of the road. There's no need to take evasive action because it's nothing but a phantom and when you turn and look, it will be gone. And here I am in the centre of York, in front of Treasurer's House. With me this morning is Ray Alexander from the original York Ghost Walk. Now tell me, Ray, is not this the most famous ghost story in the world? Yes, Richard, I think it is. And Treasurer's House is said to be the most haunted house in York. Mm. There's a story to be told about almost every room. But the story I want to tell you now is the most famous of all the ghost stories from York, quite simply because it concerns the world's oldest ghosts. It was 1953, and an 18-year-old apprentice plumber by the name of Harry Martindale was working in the cellar of Treasurer's House fixing some pipes for the central heating. He was standing at the top of a short ladder as he worked, and the only thing that was unusual on this particular occasion was that he could hear some way off in the distance the sound of a trumpet. He said it was a very ugly sound, discordant, rather like an old-fashioned car horn. But he didn't think much about it as he worked, except to wonder how it was that the sound could travel so far into Treasurer's house. But he noticed as time went by that the sound appeared to be getting louder, or perhaps nearer. 
because a few moments later a Roman soldier stepped through the wall right in front of the place where Harry Martindale was working. Harry Martindale fell off his ladder, he scuttled away into a corner and he crouched there and he hid as that soldier was followed by a troop of soldiers. He guessed there were more than 20 of them. He said they emerged through the wall against which he was working, crossed the cellar floor, disappeared through the wall on the other side of the cellar. Later he was able to describe in great detail everything that he saw, but at the time he said the only thing on his mind was to keep very still and absolutely silent, because as he said, if I could see them so close and so clearly, one of them only had to turn his head to see me, and then what would happen? So he didn't move, he didn't make a sound, but he watched. He said the first thing he noticed about these soldiers was that they were very small. Not one of them came up to more than halfway on him. He said they were very shabbily dressed, not wearing what he would have thought was a proper Roman uniform at all. In fact, the only thing that was correct about their uniforms were their helmets. It was only their helmets that he could recognise instantly from history books. He said they were exhausted, as if they'd been marching for many days, with little rest and hardly anything to eat or drink. The second soldier was lying on the back of a great untidy cart horse. Harry wasn't sure whether the man was fast asleep or dead. And the strangest thing of all, he said, was that as they crossed the cellar floor, these soldiers weren't exactly marching across. They appeared to be walking on their knees. He could see nothing of them below their knees. He was asked if he would make this public. He did so. Reluctantly, it must be said, he told the local newspaper. But soon he was being interviewed by reporters from national papers, magazines, radio, television. He always told the story the same way, the way that I've told you now, and they nearly always made a joke of it mm. because they didn't believe him and Harry Martindale who is a very honest and sincere man was so humiliated by the way they treated him that for many years he refused to tell this story to anyone but later a discovery was made that enabled Harry to tell the story with much greater confidence because under Treasurer's house they found a Roman road Mm -hmm. It's called Via Decumana, and 2,000 years ago it headed out of Roman York, Iboracum, as York was called mm -hmm. then, towards the north. And as Via Decumana leaves the city now, it runs under Treasurer's House, and it lay just 15 inches, 38 centimetres, below the cellar floor. It means that what Harry Martindale saw was not a Roman army walking on its knees, but the ghosts of Roman soldiers marching on a road that was under the cellar floor. Wow. And I've got a bit of good news for you. Treasurer's House is owned by the National Trust. It's open to the public and you can go there and even if you wish, go downstairs and have a cup of tea in the cellar. Oh boy. Unfortunately. Not the cellar where the haunting occurred. That room, I regret to say, is not open to the public. But with so many other ghosts in Treasurer's House, does that really matter? Oh, really? <laughs> Wonderful. Ray, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. It's my pleasure, Richard. I'm rather out of breath and approaching the Witcher's Tree just on the other side of Alton Towers. Wonderful legend that goes with this tree. Charles Talbot, the Earl of Shrewsbury, who lived at Alton Towers, was returning from a party along this trackway here in his horse and carriage. He was alone. As he approached this area here where the tree is, there was an old hag, a beggar woman, sitting beneath the tree. His coach slowed up and stopped and she asked him for arms, for money. And he refused her and slammed the door of his coach and galloped off along the trackway here. She put a curse on him. And she said that if any of the branches were ever to fall off this tree here, that a member of the Earl's family would die. Not many weeks later, one of the large branches of this tree was hit by lightning during a tremendous thunderstorm. The tree crashed to the ground and within days, a member of the Earl's family died. The Earl was so upset that he actually had some of his men come here with huge chains to chain up the huge boughs and branches 
of this tree. And as you can see, the chains are still on the tree to this day. They've actually eaten in to some of these huge branches here. And the Earl seemed to stop the curse because no more of his members of his family died under tragic circumstances. This tree, as I've said already, was known as the witch's tree, and even to this day, there's a coven of witches that meet under this tree on All Hallows' Eve, the night when the souls are let out of Hades, out of hell, and they have to return by first cockcrow in the morning. Pendle Hill rises above the ancient hunting ground known as the Forest of Boland. It was a place of wolves and wild boar and it was very much a place of mystery. I'm in the village churchyard of New Church in Pendle and here in 1612 took place an incredible act of persecution against the Pendle Witches. There were two old ladies known as Demdike and Chattox. Many people believed that they could have been witches. This was the time of King James I son of Mary, Queen of Scots. He was fascinated and terrified by witchcraft. He, in fact, wrote a book called Demonology. And one day, the granddaughter of this lady called Demdike was walking towards the village of Colne, begging. She asked a peddler if he would give her some pins and he refused and she said that she was a witch and that she would put a spell on him. He collapsed on the floor in a fit. He probably had a stroke and was paralysed down one side. After the event, his son took him to the local magistrates and this girl, called Alison Device, was brought before the magistrates, tried for witchcraft, but she also implicated Chattox and Demdike. They were also taken to Lancaster Castle and put on trial for witchcraft. The whole case became so serious that eventually nine members of the family were imprisoned at Lancaster. They were all sentenced to hang for witchcraft. It had been stated that they'd been consorting with the devil, that they'd been possessed by evil spirits. They were plotting to blow up Lancaster Castle. They had 16 murders supposedly taken into account. We didn't burn witches in England, we hanged them. It was the Scots that usually burnt witches. We burnt heretics. Luckily for Demdike, she died before her hanging, probably of jail fever at Lancaster Jail or the castle. The others were taken out on a cart to a hill about a mile away from Lancaster and publicly hanged and buried in an unmarked grave. And to this day, they say that those ghosts of those poor and fortunate women that were accused of witchcraft still haunt the area around here, this place of mystery, Pendle Hill.
The tower here at New Church dates from around the time of the Pendle Witches, and even to this day, on the tower you can see the eye of God. The villagers believed that that eye kept watch over them and protected them from the evil spirits that lurked around here in these hills. And just up the road here, a modern touch, a shop called Witches Galore. Let's go up the road and have a look. It's a steeper hill than I thought it was going to be, but here I am, outside Witches Galore. Good evening, ladies. And, well, it's absolutely full of things to do with witches. So we'll go in and have a look. Hi, now Maureen, you you run Witches Galore. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. what, what, I mean, what is the connection actually with, with New Church? Well, and, and Witches Galore because we trade on the history of the Pendle Witches from 1612. Right. So why we're Witches Galore. Yeah. And did anything happen actually in New Church or is it just Not close? specifically in New Church. Um, Alice Nutter lived at Ruffley, Ruffley Hall, which is just less than Oh, yeah. Down yeah. I noticed there are actually three gravestones That's right. to the Nutter family That's actually right. here in the churchyard. Yes, yes. Which I I found quite amazing. But, um, I mean, so you obviously have an awful lot of visitors we that do. come and visit anywhere, and, and buy. Anywhere, anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, mm. every day brings overseas people. If you look on the front of the counter here, this chart, yeah. we collect the word for which in whatever language, and I think there are oh. some 60 odd different languages there. Um, really? Because Wicca. Is, is actually, it's a Saxon word, is yes, that right? Yes. For, for, for wise one? Yes, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. I thought so, I yeah. <laughs> Just a bit, yeah. But, any ghost stories? Well, yes, I do. Strangely enough, um, I don't believe in ghosts. And right. Go bump in the night, yeah. right? We came to this property. We live over the shop here. Yeah. Now, the property is too handling weavers cottages made into one so it's pretty old about the 1750s well, yeah. good pedigree then yeah. and um, when we came here my husband and I had four teenage children at that point so mum used to make the dinner in the evening after mm. the shop was closed and everybody would disappear I'd be left with the washing up and the feeling was hello there's somebody there there's somebody around no there isn't yeah. Yes, there is. Just that sort of feeling, not mm. not a threatening feeling. Oh, no. No. Quite a, a sort of pleasant, uh, benign sort of uh, feel. And um, eventually, I came to feel that there was a woman mm. there, although I never physically saw anyone. No, you got the sense that yes. there was someone. Yes. Now a little there. while after that, a chap came into the shop who'd written a little book about the village, New Church folklore, fact and fiction, is about. Right. And he said, Maureen, before you, uh, before we take it to the printers, will you just go through it, see what you think about it? And we're standing at the counter, leafing through the book, and I come to a black and white sketch. Who's this? Because it made me shiver. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, I said, did you not know that's your ghost? He said, there's a young woman who walks this property. She's waiting for a lost lover that went to the war. He never came back. And the drawing is exactly as I would have pictured her. She's got her head slightly bent, she's got a mob cap on, a shawl, round her shoulders. That's coincidence number one. Yeah. At that time, the little cottage next door here, an elderly lady lived there. She was in her 80s and she was a delight. Yeah. She'd been in business all her life. She'd been a magistrate. She was a sensible, intelligent, level-headed person. And I used to go and see her in the evening. We used to have lovely conversations. And she died. Yeah. And her daughter was clearing the house. And her daughter came in one day and she said, I've, I've cleared this drawer and I've cleared that cupboard out. And um, Mum's visitor's been. And I said, oh yes, the visitor. 
she said, yes, you know. And I said, and then she looked at me and she said, you don't know what I'm talking about, do you? I said, no, not really. She had lots of visitors. She liked company. Ah, she said, did mum never tell you about the ghost? She said it was a young woman who used to walk what was from our property to uh -huh. into hers. And she knew that she'd been because of the smell, um, a sickly sweet smell, almost like Palmer Violets was how she described it. Okay. And I don't believe in things like that, but there you go. <laughs> well, I mean, how can you explain it? Yeah. yeah. You can't? It, no, 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 no. But it's just very interesting. And she's around. You, yeah. you feel her presence from time to yeah. time, which is quite benign. That's wonderful. So that's my story. Maureen, that's fantastic. And <laughs> when are you open? Every day, every day, every day, except for Christmas Day and Boxing Day. Don't really? come on Christmas Day. But for the the rest of the year, we're open. We're open all the time because there are always visitors around, even in the worst of weather. I can imagine. I look yeah. at people sometimes and I say, "Are oh, you completely mad to come yeah. on a day like this?" I bet. But they love it. Yeah. Oh, it was yeah. a bus a bus full of um, one at one afternoon in November. It was about four o'clock, so it was dark already. Wet, miserable, cold, and I sort of think, well, I can close mm. now, there's not going to be anybody, and a bus pulled in, and 24 Australian footballers came into My the show, and they thought it was wonderful because it was atmospheric. I can imagine. And they, yeah, so you right. get buses, cars, so is, oh, everything. everything. Yes. Do you get any? I was going to say, do you get any come on broomsticks? <laughs> Just <a> case. <occasion. laughs> that's wonderful. Maureen, that's fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. I'm just coming out of Lee Woods, that right on top of the hill overlooking the Clifton Suspension Bridge. And this spot here at the edge of Lee Woods is haunted by no less than the ghost of Isambard Kingdom Brunel, probably one of the most famous people connected with the city of Bristol. Over here is the most incredible view of the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Along with the SS Great Britain, it was created, designed by no less than Brunel himself. But he died before the bridge was completed. And legend has it that his ghost has been seen here on this spot many times, standing wearing a long frock coat and, of course, that large stovepipe top hat that everyone recognises. Now, why should he haunt this spot here? He didn't die here. This was his great love, the suspension bridge, and he didn't see it completed. How many times that man must have stood here on this vantage point, looking over at the gorge, imagining where one day his magnificent suspension bridge would stand is probably the reason why his spirit still stands here. Many, many sightings of ghosts are recorded to do with buildings, properties, even cars, where people who love that, that vehicle don't actually want to leave it and they linger still haunting the vehicle, sometimes even people. They actually love that person so much that they stay around to look after them. And I would think that's the reason that Brunel is seen standing here, gazing across the gorge, longingly, looking at the bridge that he never saw completed. Now, of course, while we're in Lee Woods, the suspension bridge has always been, and still is to this day, for want of a better word, a haven for suicides. In fact, as we drove over it this morning, there's actually a sign on the bridge advertising the Samaritans. And there is a sighting of another man, a young man, a modern looking person, wandering through these woods always heading towards the end of the suspension bridge and it's believed 
that he is one of the many people that actually threw himself off the bridge into the gorge. And of course, the reason that so many suicides haunt places is because of A, the tragic, traumatic death, of course, of, of throwing yourself off the top of, of something like the suspension bridge, but also the fact that, of course, taking their own life meant that they would not be allowed through the gates of heaven and would be condemned to wander this earth as a tormented soul for all of eternity. This is the Peacock Inn at Oakathorpe. It's uh, one of the oldest coaching inns in Derbyshire and it's situated on the main London to Sheffield Road. And before that, this road was the Roman road called Ricknell Street. Legend has it that the ghost of Dick Turpin can be seen at the back of this building in a sunken stable where he used to uh, stable his horse, Black Bess. He is supposed to have stayed here on his famous ride from London to York. This building goes back to the time of the Doomsday Book and was part of an old monastery that was round here, administered by what were known as the White Monks, and it was known as Ufton Barn. It's not that far from Wingfield Manor, a famous old hall where Mary Queen of Scots was imprisoned. And there is a tunnel underneath this building that leads all the way from here right through to Wingfield Manor and it's supposed to be an escape route where Mary Queen of Scots tried to escape her captivity but she didn't manage it but the tunnel is the haunted part of this building so let's go down and have a look and this is it we're now inside the peacock and this is the way down to the cellars and the tunnel mind your heads Um, of course, when you get to this part, it just looks like uh, any other cellar. Nice whitewashed until you turn the corner here. And you see the barrel vaulted part of uh, what's a bit more sinister down here. And very, very dark. And now, feeling my way, literally, along this little barrel vaulted cellar and tunnel which leads me through and then on the right hand side here is the gap and it takes you straight down through the inky blackness and down into the old tunnel that leads all the way to Wingfield Manor. I might as well just take a trip down in the inky blackness and have a look. It's usually very wet down here I don't think I can get much farther. Ah, oh, yes, I'm down. And that's me just about to disappear. I hope nothing comes up to see me. Because this is where the white... And I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> right, and now we're inside the newly refurbished Peacock Inn. And just around the corner here, the cellar. Nice and light here. To mind your head as you go down but um, quite uh, clean and white, just like any other cellar really. Nothing to get excited about at all. Not until you turn here and then you see parts of the old original barrel vaulted tunnel that starts here. It gets very dark, very damp, very smelly as we make our way along the tunnel here as far as here, this is as far as we get. Because down here on the right hand side is the cutaway from the original tunnel that goes all the way to Wingfield Manor. Um, and I've got to get myself down there into the dark, but it's very dark. So I think the first thing I need to do is to just give myself a bit of light. Not a lot, but it'll help. 
It's not nice down here, by the way. Not for the faint-hearted. Because you never know what you're going to meet coming up. It also floods. And you never know whether you're going to get your feet wet. And it stretches on and I'm going down. Down ever deeper. Wondering how far I'm going to get before I actually either see something or hit the water level. But as yet I'm alright. I didn't like that. That candle went out. <laughs> I didn't like that at all. That was not part of the show. And I'm going to try very quickly and light it again. That just went out for absolutely no reason whatsoever. And that was not fixed. Um, the tunnel is down here, but uh, undaunted, I'm going on. All of a sudden, it just decides that it's going to go out. And I'll tell you something, I'll tell the story now before I get any farther. Round here, through there, is the tunnel. Dug, they believe, originally by the white monks. They think it could well have been as a coal mine. But a number of monks were killed during the digging. And a lot of the staff that come down here where the barrels are have seen a ghostly figure of a monk dressed in white with a hood but with no face hovering above the ground hovering towards them and I'll be quite honest with you there are very few members of the staff here that will actually venture down into these cellars alone they usually go in pairs other things have happened glasses blow up blow up like laminated windscreens and uh, it's a long time since I've felt <laughs> as nervous about anything as I am here because as soon as I move the candle towards the start of the tunnel it decides to go out but I'm gonna it's gone that's it I'm out of here I'm not <laughs> going in there <laughs> and that's the end of it Derbyshire is very much a place of uh, legend of mystery of stone circles and burial grounds. Most of them tend to be up in the high peak, the dark peak, but this one here on Stanton Moor, not far from Matlock, is a very interesting one. This is the Nine Ladies, a very strange, inhospitable place. Bronze Age, Many burials round here, and quite a few hauntings, of course. A black dog, a large black dog, is known to wander around the hills and in and out of the trees. A man dressed in black has often been seen standing just on the outside of these stones. And a lady in grey is often seen walking the pathways round here. But these circles have a very special legend behind them. The nine ladies were said to have been dancing on the Sabbath. And this large stone at the end here, known as the Fiddler's Chair, and sat on this stone playing his fiddle for the nine ladies to dance, was none other than the devil himself. God was not happy at this, and so he turned all of them into stone. And these are the nine ladies of stone that can still be seen here to this day. And I'm poised at the bottom of the spiral staircase going up the Boston stump. I've been told not to run for the first hundred steps, and I'm certainly not going to do that, but I can actually hear the wind thundering up the tower. 
I'm not sure what to expect when I get there, but we'll soon see. So let's go and have a look. I'm, I'm nearly at the top. I'm just about worn out. And that wind that's howling, I've never heard anything like it. I'm not a great lover of heights. And I've never known anything quite like this. I'm halfway up the Boston stump. And the story is that St. Bottles actually founded his monastery here on this site where the stump is now. And on frequent occasions, he preached sermons to the devil on this spot. The devil could do very little about it. And the wind that still howls around this stump is reputed to be the devil huffing and puffing in exasperation because he could do nothing about some bottles and incessant preaching here. And I've had enough. It's a very long way down there. I'm getting out of here and going down. Oh boy, what a long way down. There's also a legend that a young woman in white is seen every autumn throwing herself off this tower and floating down rather quickly and hitting the ground how she managed or how she dared to even get close enough to this parapet to actually throw herself off, I don't know. They also tell me that in the actual main part of the church down below, the organist has actually seen a figure walking along the central aisle when there's only him been in there. And they say that he's the most down-to-earth, reliable sort of person that just would not in his wildest dreams, make up ghost stories. And just standing here, looking at the graffiti all over the walls of the brave people that came up here, including Jay Huggins in 1789. But I've had enough. It's time for me to make a sharp exit. I'm going to leave the wind the devil and St. Bottles to it, and I'm going back down. This, to say the least, is a bit of a scoop. I am actually in the middle of Highgate Cemetery. This was the first municipal cemetery to be created in this country in 1839 and was consecrated by no less than the Bishop of London. Before 1839, graveyards of churches in this country were absolutely crammed full of bodies. People were fed up of two things. One of their loved ones being dug up by resurrectionists or grave robbers and then sold to doctors for dissection for up to two guineas a time. The other problem was the overcrowding in the churchyards. And in fact, if a grave had been there for five years, someone would then come along and open it. While the loved ones were actually standing around the grave, they would, the sexton would dig down, and if the coffin had crumbled and collapsed and the body was in a state of semi-decay, they would then stamp on the bones, crush them into the ground, and then another coffin would be put on top. In other circumstances, if the coffin was still intact, it would be lifted out of the graveyard. The decomposing body would be taken out and again stamped into the ground and covered by a little bit of soil. Then the new coffin would be put down. This was not acceptable for people. And so this cemetery, with railings all the way round, was created here in 1839. I have never been so surrounded 
by dead people as I am here. And of course there are lots of ghost stories. There's a figure in a black cloak that stands by the north gate. It has long pointed fingernails and beckons towards people that are walking down Swain's Lane. There is also an old lady, a mad woman, a murderess, that has been seen wandering around this graveyard, looking longingly at the names of the children's graves that are here. Apparently she was a child murderer, and she's looking at the names of the children that she murdered here. Charles Dickens is buried here. Karl Marx is buried here, and many, many famous people, murderers, politicians, and stars, all buried here in Highgate Cemetery. There is also a story of a vampire, and people walking along Swain's Lane, looking through the North Gate, have seen a larger-than-life figure dressed in black with an ashen face and fangs, and blood dripping from those fangs, coming up out of the ground of one of the large tombs. On frequent occasions, people have actually broken in here and have gone down into the tombs, and on one occasion, someone broke in and found in the catacomb three coffins, one of them with the lid open, and the coffin was empty. decided it's time to leave Highgate Cemetery. This is the only way for me in or out. And I've decided to leave before it gets dark. Hello, my name's Richard Felix. And I'm here at my base, at the Old County Jail, in the centre of Derby. This place, over the last 150 years, has been a place of terror, torment, and of course death. And that's one of the reasons why this place is as haunted as it is. I've chosen Derby as the catalyst for the national ghost tour of Great Britain. Over the last 10 years, I have taken in excess of 95,000 people on a ghost tour somewhere around the Midlands. And of course, have spoken to many of those people on the tours and of course have realised just how fascinated people are by ghosts. This is the reason that we have chosen to do this tour. The video that you've just watched is a part of that series. But I want your help. If you have a ghost story, then please either email me or write to me at the address that you'll see at the end of this video. Of course, you must remember that after speaking to so many people, I think I have an ability to be able to see through some of the stories, to be able to differentiate between a story that is true or a story that's made up. And of course, you must remember that eight out of ten ghost stories can be explained, but it's the other two that you've got to worry about. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Do sleep well and don't have nightmares. <laughs>